in about a week's time, probably just as we wind up uh, at Think, Airtel Think here, China is going to go through one of its once in a decade change of power, transfer of power. And everybody is agog to see what that change in power is going to bring to this country that pretty much every nation watches both with awe, anxiety, a certain degree of covetousness, and almost always a sense of dread. What about this country evokes that? Today, we have two splendid speakers, one who believes that China will be the most dominant country in eight years, almost akin to uh, you know, the breadth and uh, power of, of uh, UK, uh, England, at the height of the empire. And there is somebody from within China who is perhaps a little more skeptical. So we have both the dragon head and the snake tail. And I have to warn you that at some point, the snake tail might morph into the tiger woman. So please welcome Arvind Subramaniam and Mei Zhang to discuss China. The Chinese economy doubles in size about every eight years. Perhaps in the middle of the century, China will be 15 to 20 percent of the world. The issue now is how does China keep this up? China needs more consumption. For the first time in the country's history, urban residents will outnumber rural ones. All the shops in this mall are empty. Not that that worries the government, because they're simply more concerned with maintaining economic growth. And one way of achieving that is building cities. Officials announced an ambitious plan to move some 2.8 million people out of poverty-stricken and disaster-prone areas over the course of 10 years. Officials say the only way to get the old folk to move permanently is to destroy their houses after they leave. industrial growth ended up leaving a legacy of pollution. This month, demonstrations against a proposed copper refinery forced local officials to abandon the idea. Home videos like this one posted online captured this standoff evoking outrage. model of repression, arresting people in demonstrations, no longer works, and the Chinese leadership knows it. So that's the two faces of China. One of increasing domestic unrest. I think the official figure is 150,000 riots a year. Un unhappy labor, environment issues, massive protests, green protests, uh, a new generation that is uncomfortable with the political constructs of the old. China, in fact, is at the cusp, a very ironic cusp, when the question it faces is that will its economic growth now allow the political certitudes and political constructs? How much more can it grow economically before the old political ways uh, implode on themselves? Arvind Subramaniam is a senior fellow in the Peterson Institute of International Economics. Foreign Policy magazine picked him as one of the 100 most influential thinkers in the world last year. And he published a book called Eclipse last year, Living in the Shadow of China's Dominance, which has really created a ripple across the world because his argument is that it's not that China will rise in the next 10 years, but that it has already risen and America is already subjugated and, and, and subservient to China in many ways. And that um, provocative theory is something that Arvind will be talking about. He's the dragon head, the China booster. And we have Mei Zhang, who started out from a working class background, went to Harvard, earned a degree, but came back to China 
to start a wildlife and conservation tour, an adventure tour, which today has been uh, stamped by the National Geographic as the best wildlife travel company in the world. And Zhang uh, May combines both the possibility and potency of China, but she also is aware of what is happening domestically and inside, and what makes China in this extremely uncomfortable position, whether will it really implode, or will it, as Arvind says, dominate the whole world as the British Empire once did. May, let me start with you, because I'm more on your axis. You know? <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about your own trajectory? And what does it exemplify about China? You know, in what ways has these last 20, 30 years you know, of extreme growth, double-digit growth, done domestically uh, in terms of culture and society and politics uh, to your country? Um. I think I'm at the age group that practically lived the rise of China of the past 30, 40 years. I mean, when I came from one of the Western provinces called Yunnan and in a normal worker's family, and the income there was about $20 when I was $20 a month when I was little. And now that area is tenfold, 15 folds difference. Um, but I got very lucky that after college, I exited China and went to HBS, um, went back to China to look at a project. But let me tell you how I started Wild China. That actually shows more the contrast this country is, is facing. It was about 12 years ago when I was, uh, there was no Wild China. I was in Rajagupta land. I think a lot of us here know the reference. I was sent by McKinsey to go and uh, help the Nature Conservancy to uh, study the alternative economic development model in my hometown province. Um, the Nature Conservancy wanted to build a national park in Yunnan, which if this project is to take, take place in America, they would just raise millions of funds, buy the piece of land, and um, put it aside, wait for the scientists to come up with a conservation plan, and everything will go as planned beautifully. There was only one hitch, hiccup to this problem, is there were five million people living in those areas, and these five million people are racing to get rich, as everywhere else in China. And so as the conservation plans were being developed, the government was receiving dozens of different proposals to build a railway here, to build a five-star hotel there, a cable car here. And the conservation side run as NGOs, honestly, I felt was lacking in speed because it, it was basically they were racing the conservationists, environmentalists, and the um, business people were doing things at very different pace. And I thought, is there a way, is there a for-profit approach that I could somehow still help the locals to get wealthier and still retain what they have, the beautiful cultures in those areas. And just by the way, that area rises from tropical land at 1,000 meters all the way up to 6,000 meters of glacier. The, the drama of the landscape and the diversity of the biodiversity there is incredible. But with mass tourism, this would come under pressure. And that's why I started Wild China. Uh, but today, I think, I think the economic development has become a wave that's non-stoppable, which is a bit sad to see. Um, but I can't blame the locals for wanting to have a better life. You said the economic wave is unstoppable, and I think you're betraying me because our lunchtime conversation was that you were going to contradict him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, Arvind, on what do you base this idea that China is already dominant and that it is going to be unstoppable? And would you concede that there are Jonathan Fenby, who was supposed to be the third person here, has been held up by the hurricane. And he would have argued that there are extremely uh, difficult circumstances domestically for China. Would you concede that? And under what circumstances do you claim this theory of dominance? Right. So, so let me begin with the dominance story. So uh, what I did in my book was to just look back at, at the previous two superpowers. And, and I'm already calling the US a previous superpower. So my uh, uh, apologies to, the, to my American colleagues here. So if you look back at history and look at the US and the United Kingdom over the last uh, 150, 200 years, 
And, and what you see is that, you know, there are two or three very simple, you know, determinants, economic determinants of, of dominance. One is just how big a country's uh, economy is. Uh, second is how big a trader it is. And after all, we know that, you know, uh, the United Kingdom was a big trader and, and it dominated, uh, and imperialism was a lot about trade. And also how strong a country is in terms of its external financial strength. If you just put those three variables together uh, and compute an index as I did, you know, to cut a long story short, China's, you know, on that measure, China today is as strong as the United States. Uh, and within 10 to 15 years, it, it will overtake the United States. And so what I kind of provocatively say is that, you know, uh, the U.S. has these fond hopes of, you know, oh, well, maybe it's not a G20, maybe it's not a G7, maybe it's a G2. And I say, no, 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 no there's no G2. There's going to be a G1, and that one is not going to be the United States of America. Uh, and, and people get kind of quite, uh, you know, provoked by this. So, so, um, so the way I kind of capture this in my book is, you know, the beginning of my book, which I would urge you to read, even if you don't read the rest of the book, what happens is that, in, you know, the year is 2021, and the United States president is, uh, you know, has just been elected. Uh, the U.S. is going through a big financial uh, crisis, and they need money, they need resources, because, you know, the fiscal situation is out of control. Uh, they can't borrow from Europe because Europe is a similar basket case. They can't borrow from all the oil shakes because thanks to the efforts of people like Mona, they've all been replaced by, 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 by democracies. So the, uh, the U.S. has no choice but to go to the IMF for money. Uh, and there, you know, the, goes, the president goes to the IMF, and then the IMF head happens to be a Chinese gentleman, uh, and he says, sorry, no money until you withdraw your forces from the South China Sea. I, 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 and that's the way the scenario unfolds. So, I mean, I'm being a little bit provocative here, but this was unthinkable five, seven, eight years ago, but thanks to the rise of China and the weakness of the US, this is becoming possible. Now, the second part of your question is that, do I concede that China is going through a difficult phase? And, and absolutely. In fact, if you, if, you, if you look at China today, a confluence of three or four things have come together that makes this a very difficult situation. One, the old China growth model is, is now on its last legs. China has been growing by exporting and investing, and there's a limit to that. You know, the rest of the world is not willing to absorb the exports, and how many buildings can you build where people don't occupy, right? Uh, then I think the whole external environment is very weak, but I think most, uh, most I think saliently of all, for the first time, because of all the scandals that have erupted, the legitimacy of the ruling party is now seriously in question. You know, we talk about corruption scandals here. I mean, similar things have happened in China. So the question is that, can China navigate these challenges going forward? And my view is that, in fact, in some ways, all of this is a blessing for China because it creates the sense of crisis that will force the new Chinese leadership to change the growth model in a way that Mona, you and Tehelka will, 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 will like, you know, more consumption, more concern for the environment. More consumption. I mean, less as opposed to less investment. You know, you know, not keep building buildings, but, you know, looking at the welfare of the poor, uh, more environmentally conscious decisions, more on food safety, environmental safety, and so on. I think these are decisions that are going to uh, happen, uh, and I'm cautiously optimistic on that. Uh, May, I'm going to come to you, but Arvind, just to pursue this thought, People in India are often impatient that we have slipped from 8% growth to 6% growth. Right. Given the kind of rapid uh, growth that China had and the huge issues that it has, it's, it's actually quite fascinating to see that what is now making China stumble is exactly the same issues that makes Indian democracy move slower, but perhaps more maturely. Labor unrest, a sense of inequity, environment issues, uh, you know, the social media creating a sense of entitlement and deepening of democracy. Right. Uh, would you be somebody who says that it's okay to move a bit slower rather than go at a headlong pace and hit the wall and then come back to these issues? So, so, so when I'm, um, I think that's a great question. But I think in a sense, it's, 
you know, which countries really have these choices, Mona? I mean, you know, Ashona, because, you know, I, I, I'm often reminded of, of uh, uh, you know, Donald Rumsfeld who said, you know, the famous quote, and I say, you know, you go to bat with the political system you have, not with the political system you wish you had, you know. Uh, you know, democracies function in a certain way, autocracies, you know, or, or uh, you know, the, the transformation that's happening in China, they function different ways. So, so I, I mean, if I, if I were given a, a choice, you know, it very much depends upon who you are in that society to whom this question is posed. If I were a Dalit in India, I would obviously choose the, the Chinese model because of the transformation of the lives of people at the bottom. But if I were, you know, a part of the elite and I could have bread and freedom, I would be, choose to be an Indian. Arvind, we are going to get sidetracked to a discussion on Indian economy because I think you're completely wrong. Okay. The tribals and the Dalits are the ones who are resisting a fast pace of growth because, in fact, they are environmental livelihood, you know, they, they are livelihood environmentalists. They do not want to pay later. They understand the cost now. So, you know, you're quite wrong on that. It's... it's I, I, I mean, but, I, but we don't I, want to get sidetracked. Yeah, I would like to pose that question to all the Dalits who are still in poverty, who still don't have access to, to all the basic amenities of life, uh, and pose that question to them and not to you, Shona. Arvind, in fact, I pose that question all the time. Okay. And they are often saying that we are getting richer, the people like us in this hall, but they are not. I, I mean, that's, that's not a fair statement. Yes, India has become richer in the last uh, you know, years of liberalization but they feel the pain of cost and they don't want to go to Cancun, you know, they want the environmental consciousness right now, you know, but let's not get sidetracked. May, I just wanted to come back to you to ask you this question that he brought up, you know, that people are now impatient and much more questioning of the old certitudes of the communist government, you know. Is the government and Beaujolais and, you know, all the scandals that have erupted, has it been a tectonic moment inside? Do you feel that your peer group is very, very different in what it demands out of its political establishment now? Um, I would say probably not. No. You Sorry. have had a deal behind my <laughs> 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 No, but what I wanted to say is, in fact, I think I, I spent a couple of years recently um, in the US, and I saw this fear in America Everyone talks about China is out there to get our jobs. China is out there to get us. China is going to dominate the whole world. And, and I think it, it is a mistake to overestimate um, China's power. But it's also equally a mistake to underestimate China's capabilities. And so my point is to say, actually, we don't know what's going to happen. Spoken like a true confusion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a consultant. Um, Um, but, but seriously, you look at China, with its thousands of years of history, um, we have gone through many sort of morphs of our society, and not to mention the last 200 years, we've gone through a tremendous amount, right? The last 40 years, we went through economic revolution, social revolution, uh, industrial revolution, um, even cultural sexual revolution, cultural, well, uh, cultural revolution, <laughs> but even sexual revolution. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the role of women in society, how much women are able to participate in the society from my grandma's generation who had her feet bound right. in three inches. Right. right? So, and, and I'm here wearing a short skirt <laughs> uh, on stage. I mean, that is China's uh, change, its incredible capability to sort of adapt and change, but it also says something to me and say, in the next 20, 30 years, what could happen to this country? I don't know, I really don't know, because, I mean, Bo Xilai, it, if history were replayed, Bo Xilai could have created something more like the Cultural Revolution in China. In, that was a possibility in less a year ago, but things just changed completely. So I think it's hard to predict. And I would say in China now, among, say, my friends group, I have to admit we are the lucky ones who are benefiting from the system. We're the ones who went overseas to study and returned. And we are benefiting from actually, in Chinese we say, having our feet on two boats. You know, we are making our money in China, and then we have maybe a green card, uh, a passport in the U.S. And a lot of people want to get in this boat, and we don't want to rock either boat. 
um, but a situation could be different at the... But me, I mean, wouldn't that kind of economic, uh, you know, growth and, and new materialism uh, make people restive with the kind of autocratic government there is? How is it that one borrows those things from the West, you know, all the material well-being, but you don't but you don't get those concepts of freedom. What is it about Chinese society that is so comfortable with autocracy? With, with, um, with uh, government ruling, you mean? Um, th th this is something that I think it takes a Chinese to understand a Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> but you are the representative here. <laughs> Fully rank here. <laughs> I mean, th th for example, yeah, there are, this morning we talked about censorship on the internet and the impossibility to do so. Yes, in China, I cannot log on Facebook, I cannot get on YouTube, I, you know, when there was this article, recently New York Times was just blocked, but as a Chinese per this kind of thing, when you state it on the international stage, it's a huge horror, how can you do that? Um, that's dictatorship. For people living there, um, if you want to get that article, you know how to get it. If you want to jump over the Great Firewall, you know how to jump over the Great Firewall. And um, on Chinese social media called Weibo, which is equivalent of Twitter, but it's just much more interactive and much more alive in China. Uh, Twitter is not available either, along with Facebook. Um, so on Weibo, yeah, we all know there are certain words that are censored. You just don't use those words and you go around it. You say the same thing that you wanted to say. And so for people there, we feel the existing economic system, or at, le at least among my friends I'm speaking, we feel like the is existing system is working uh, and we could voice what we wanted to voice privately, and that's okay. But fortunately, I mean, there are some activists out there speaking for the bigger general masses. I was just going to say that you mirror India in that sense, because as I was arguing with Arvind, those who really stand up for civil liberties are the, are the working classes, are the tribals and the Dalits, and uh, you know, it's people agree. who are affluent and comfortable are quite, you know, are quite happy to make peace with governments that just allow them to grow materially, you know, and civil liberties don't matter because you're never going to get put in jail in any case, you know, so that's probably one thing. But Arvind, just to ask you two questions. One is that, why do we fear Chinese dominance when we're comfortable with having so many decades of US dominance? You know, what is going to be the essential difference? And two, what is the strategy, if this dominance is inevitable, what is the strategy to make it benign, you know? Right, um, so, so I think the first point to make is that, you know, I think all superpowers um, abuse their power. I mean, the United States abused its power. You know, for example, I used to work in Geneva during the intellectual property negotiations, and you know, the United States foisted these, uh, you know, patent rules on all developing countries. You know, that was an abuse of power. A and the American president, uh, John Adams, has a great line. He says, a "Power always thinks it has a great soul." So, so that's the justification for abusing power. So, in that sense, I think China will be like any other power, you know, prone to. But I think there is an extra uh, layer of fear about China, I think for two reasons. One, internally it's not quite as democratic and as open as, you know, the US and the UK were during their uh, years of supremacy. So I think that's, I think, one. And of course, uh, the role of the army in China is still a little bit uh, unknown, uncertain and how much that's independent, how much it's controlled by civilians. I think, so, so I think that's, I think, a, a real unknown and, and something different from the previous two superpowers. And I think uh, the, the other reason, of course, we fear China, which is different from the United States, is that the United States had this uh, benefit of this, what they call splendid geographic isolation. No neighbors, uh, you know, I think Bismarck famously said that uh, the United States was surrounded on two sides with weak neighbor, neighbors and the other two sides with fish. Uh, you know, uh, Ch China unfortunately has a lot of neighbors and relationships in the neighborhood have not been great and, and I think that's what I think gives rise to anxiety uh, about China. So the question is that how do you deal with China? So I'm of the view that the way to deal with China is for, you know, a much more multilateral approach 
where basically what you do is that you tether China more and more into the existing system so that China itself has a stake, self-interest, in behaving uh, kind of according to international norms. So just to give you one example, you know, I don't like the fact that China is lending all this money to Africa on terms that are extremely suspect, you know, uh, uh, an oil deal here, you know, th there's no Taiwanese embassy that's been allowed to be open uh, in, in, in Africa because China is giving money. So I would much rather China as a superpower work through multilateral institutions because, you know, at least there, there's the counterweight of all the other countries on the other side to kind of soften China and to tether China much more. I, I think countries that deal, try and deal with China on their own or in small groups will feel uh, themselves overwhelmed by China. And, and that's why my, my strong belief is that we need a much more multilateral approach to dealing with China. So what have been the salient features of this kind of exponential growth, uh, Arvind? You know, if you were to just sum it up in like five points, you know? You see, I, I, I think... And, and why is it hitting a wall right now? You know, so so the, I think the first part of the question, and I'm going to give you a, a, a controversial part answer to the first part of the question, is that while it is true that the Chinese takeoff happened um, after China turned towards markets under Deng, you know, it's glorious to be rich, that famous statement, right? But what people don't understand is that the difference between China and, say, even India and Africa and everything has been the quality of the Chinese state. The Chinese Communist Party is history's most, one of history's most effective economic institutions in delivering security and basic essential services and building infrastructure. You know, health, education, etc. The Chinese state has created the preconditions for markets to work in a way that the Indian state has not been able to. You know, there is no dearth of markets. There is no dearth of markets in the Anawadi slum that Kate Boo wrote about. So the problem is not markets. It's the problem is that that basic capacity of the state to produce these essential services we lack in, in China. What's going to be the, the, the bottleneck? I think you can do, you can have too much of a good thing. I think the time has come for China to stop, you know, investing more and exporting more and to be much more focused on, you know, providing more employment, you know, ensuring that wages do go up, ensuring that people have, you know, access to social security and all the things that kind of a, a Western safety net looks like, I think China needs to acquire more of. May if, if the China story is as feel good as Arvind makes it out to be, why are there 150,000 riots a year? And that's an official figure. Um, I would say the general picture that Arvind um, was sharing is, is what we see on the surface. You, you see the growth numbers. And you see us surging to number two worldwide in GDP. But whatever that number, even when we become number one or number one lag in the rest of the world by a huge gap, divide that number by 1.4 billion. People used to say, if you sell a shoe to a Chinese, you'll be a billionaire. Right? Now, now you have to share GDP with 1.4 billion people. And um, we are, what, a few notches above Namibia um, in real parts of the country. And so the polarization of wealth distribution is obviously causing a lot of social stress, and as well as the, the uh, degradation of the environment. As you can, some of these remote, beautiful areas that I went to in the Tibetan mountains, you would see this beautiful stream, and then I thought, wow, that green, that color green is really pretty. The further upstream you go, I looked at it, and I say, well, it doesn't look exactly that pretty anymore. Then you get to this reservoir, you realize this is a completely polluted pond and the stream from washing the copper in the mine up there. And the local Tibetans living around there, they're not going to be happy. And they're, they're grassland, you know, they're... Um, but the mine owner is getting very rich. And so this interest... I think is causing a lot of the social fabric to be torn in different ways. And you don't feel that any desire for democracy is growing in the country at all? 
I'm sorry, say that so again. I said you, there isn't any desire for, you know, more open political frameworks growing in the country. Not in, not in your friend's circle, but uh -huh. uh, lower down. No, no. Um, I would say that the desire for democracy is definitely there. And in my, among my friends, it's probably not vocal. Or we vocal privately, but you know, in our eyes, it's pretty much we get whatever we want. Right? But the, for the rest of the society, it is becoming much more vocal. If you go on Chinese social media, you will see if there is a river that is dammed and the local communities are upset about it, you will hear the voices loud and clear. And, um, and it's, it's a good thing. Even some of these public media are covering some of these events. Maybe not the mouthpieces like China Daily. They may not carry these riots, but... Uh, you know, People know where to seek news. Um, yeah, in, in fact, as I said, I'm, I'm sort of missing Jonathan severely uh, because there's interesting, uh, I think in Kidong, where recently there was a, a pipeline that was going to uh, pollute the water system mm. for a local community. And there was so much resistance on social media that for the first time the local government actually scrapped uh, a plant. And that's been happening a lot anecdotally across China where people are standing up for their environmental rights and, and the government is backing off. So just before we finish, uh, Arvind, because this political change is so imminent, uh, I think its own uh, mouthpiece, the communist mouthpiece Seeking Truth has said that we can no longer stand where we are and we can't turn back. The status quo will not work. What do you think this transfer of power is going to be? You know, who, who's going to come in? Is there going to be any changes in the way uh, political power is practiced in China? So, so you know, uh, you're asking, uh, you know, the, the million-dollar question that, you know... Uh, that everyone is asking. Uh, everyone's asking. And when you said political change is imminent, I mean, I, I, I don't... Uh, th that's too strong a statement for, you know, because that statement could have been said 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 15 years ago, and things didn't happen. So, so I think it, it's, it's a big, uh, a big unknown. I think what I, I do think is that the new leadership that comes into power, I think will, does not have the luxury of saying, let's just chug along, you know, and things will look after themselves. They won't, because, you know, the old growth model stuck. I, I think there's a, there's a great line uh, from, the, from the novel uh, called the, the Leopard, where the character Tancredi says, the more things have to remain the same, the more things will have to change. So I think China is exactly in, in that situation. I think uh, it will have to change politically, it will have to change economically. Uh, and the question really is this, can the party control this change in a way that doesn't get out of control and cataclysmic? So is control change possible politically? I think that's the billion dollar question for China. Thank you. Uh, I've been heavily outnumbered by both my panelists in this session. Uh, I feel, at least from the limited knowledge I have, that China is at a huge cusp. Everything that Arvind says is true. Everything that May says is true. But I think there are a lot of lessons from China that India could take, uh, particularly about moving at a hurtling pace towards something which gives the, the semblance of great prosperity, but the foundations are weak. You have a lovely image about America being this apartment block that right. is full of wonderful, uh, right, uh, right. you know, um, penthouses on top, the middle rung is corrupted, the bottom is flooded, and the elevator doesn't work. Right, you know? right. So yeah. <laughs> that, that is where too much of growth can take us. And I'm glad, at least for Indian democracy. Let's see what next week brings for China. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, we shall